you. So today, uh, we have our biopesticide regulation expert, uh, Mr. Louis Sugiyama with us, who will be taking you through different presentations uh, and introductions and background and overview on biopesticide regulation. So I would like to invite a uh, few of you might have uh, seen a party team earlier. You might have participated in the previous uh, training sessions. For those who are new, uh, we welcome you to the group. And uh, with that, I would like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Ravi Ketrapal, Executive Secretary of APARI, to provide opening remarks. Dr. Ravi, over to you. You are on uh, mute, Dr. Ravi. Uh, Noe, please, uh, could you please? <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. Well, uh, good evening and good morning. I have a proud privilege and pleasure to welcome one and all in this very important workshop on biopesticide regulatory workshop uh, and overview. Uh, we may not have time to introduce each and every participant today. And we have to make the best use of time of uh, Luis Sugiyama, who is with us, who's going to play a major role in the whole workshop. So my apologies for that, but I may like to mention just three or four points very quickly. First of all, a big thank you to Director PPW, uh, Dr. Mohammed Abu Sayyid Mia, and Mr. Subrata Das, who had played a very active role for where we have reached now in making a national team and in announcing it and networking and bringing all on this platform. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sayyid Mia and Subrata Das. Uh, I, we really appreciate your efforts and involvement. Having said that, uh, I would like to say that we, we have, uh, developed a survey, pre-workshop and post-workshop. And I'm sure most of you must have taken the pre-workshop survey. And then there will be a post-workshop survey. This is more for APARI, you know, or for USDA, so that we capture it and what our outputs and monitoring and evaluation program properly in the, how, how we are moving ahead with all the participants. Mr. Luis Sugiyama is the key player today. Uh, a Japanese born in Peru, living in US, working globally and so on and so forth. I would not like to say much about him. He will be giving you a very crisp overview of the subject, uh, highlighting biopesticides, importance, and then also the assessment of current regulatory process in Bangladesh with uh, active discussion. And then we will have some next steps, what to be done after this. The point I want to highlight is, uh, we are very happy to have a large number of those who registered. We have more than 30 who have joined. We may have maybe 20 more. Uh, this is a first overview workshop. And we really appreciate the overwhelming support from all of you to really register and come. However, uh, to be honest and to be frank, we may have two more workshops where along with uh, Director PPW, we will be trying to shortlist uh, about 10 to 15 participants as we dive deeper into the subject. And which, uh, we, which will be easier for Luis to talk to directly to people who are more in measures and in the policy issues related to biopesticide. One more point I would like to make is uh, soon after this uh, workshop in the coming weeks, we are going to start uh, residual decline studies, where again, you will see the importance of biopesticides, when to spray, when the last spray has to come, and there'll be studies carried out, hopefully, hopefully, uh, on face-to-face -face, uh, in the lab. Uh, I wish we can avoid online there, but we'll see how it goes, which where uh, from the team, uh, we will have Grace, we will have uh, Kevin, 
and we will have Wing Chang who will be playing a role regarding lab work and also the field work. So the stage is being set now to look at this very important objective of uh, overcoming the MRL barriers for complying to the core diets and how we can boost export. I will not say much. I would like to stop here. And I would like to thank once again to each and every one of you with the note that please be very interactive with the experts, both online and offline. Thank you, one and all. Over to you, Nishikarasasi. Thank you so much, Dr. Ravi, for this uh, very warm welcoming remarks. With that, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Mohammed Abu Sayed Mia, direct uh, PPW, uh, to give his remarks, opening remarks. Dr. Sayed, over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> this is the first workshop. Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate all of you, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning and good evening to all of you. I have the proud privilege to wonderful welcome you all of the first biopesticide regulatory workshop in Bangladesh. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the contribution provided by the aligned USAID, USDA, and APAR team. My gratitude goes to Dr. Robi Khetropal, Executive Secretary, APARI, Bargua Gloria, TFA, FAS of USAID, and all other dignitaries who are attend the workshops. My, all the participants who have attended this inclusive Zoom workshop, I'd like to congratulate them again. My heartfelt thanks to the USAID, USDA, FAS, and APARI team for their endless support to Bangladesh to improve phytosanitary trade compliance and pesticide residue mitigation through increased awareness of the importance of harmonization of pesticide MRLs with Codex and United States for trade and promoting integrated pest management efforts. You will be glad to know that for pesticide residue field and laboratory research, quality assurance, biopesticide efficacy research and biopesticide regulation, we have constituted Bangladesh team in response to US specialist team to carry on the above activities. We hope the assistance of USG specialist team, we will be able to develop our expertise for analyzing pesticide residues in field and laboratory and biopesticide efficacy research. And above all, we will learn the process of biopesticides regulation. Moreover, I am very glad to know that the project will work to provide strategic expertise and coordination of the harmonization of policies and strategies between ASEAN and South Asian countries for regulatory harmonization. It is also encouraging that the project will work on the use and trade of biological control agent, that is BCA, and biopesticide registration. I assure all of you that the collaborators and our officials will work sincerely and very closely with you for faithful implementation of these activities. Again, my sincere gratitude and thanks from DA and our collaborators to USG and APARI team and for creating such a wonderful opportunity to enable us competent in this field. With these few words, I'd like to conclude my speech. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Saeed, for your continuous support uh, and your very great uh, opening remarks. I would like to now invite uh, Ms. Gloria Aire Bargua, 
or a representative from USDA FAS to give your remarks, please. Thank you so much, Sassi, and thank you so much, uh, Honorable Dr. Abusai Mia, for your clear leadership throughout all of our collaborative efforts between USDA, Agaline, and of course, APARI. My name is Gloria Ide Burgoa, and I'm one of the focal points at the US Department of Agriculture for an Agricultural Services in Washington, DC. I think uh, for my brief remarks, I'd just like to provide some context on why we're all here today. This workshop ultimately contributes to a larger goal of supporting Bangladesh's agricultural exports through compliance with pesticide trade standards like maximum residue limits or MRLs. MRLs being one of the leading trade barriers that unnecessarily restricts global trade, agricultural productivity, as well as economic growth. As our experts have explained before, mitigating pesticide residues in crops can be achieved by utilizing alternative pest control methods, such as biopesticides, which we will be learning about today. Today's workshop, as has been mentioned, is the first of a series of workshops focused on establishing a streamlined and harmonized biopesticide registration process in Bangladesh. To end things, I would just like to give very special thanks to the APARI team, of course, um, to the Plant Protection Wing, and special thanks to Mr. Subrata Kumadas and the recently formed Bangladesh National, M National MRL team, because you've been provided swiftly and crucial information on the status of, of biopesticides and registration in Bangladesh. With that, I'd like to welcome uh, the main player here, Mr. Luis Sugoyama, who has uh, expertise at a global level on this subject and who's the main facilitator of today's workshop. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Ire. Like Ire mentioned, now we will have a main player, uh, Mr. Luis Sugiyama. He'll be taking us through different aspects of biopesticide regulation for next one hour and 30 minutes. Uh, the stage is yours, Mr. Luis, please. Uh, thank you, Sasi. Can, can you confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, we can see your slide first slide. Yes. Yeah, good morning and good evening uh, to all of the participants. And thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in this workshop. I would like to uh, begin by uh, thanking uh, the APARI team, as well as uh, the uh, US Department of Agriculture, the Foreign Agricultural Service, as well as uh, uh, to Dr. Abu Sayyid Amin from the uh, PPW of Bangladesh. So thank you so much for the opportunity. What uh, we were hoping in this first regulatory workshop is to, first of all, provide like a general overview so that all of us will know uh, about pesticides. So we will have, we will we'll start talking about regulatory development of biopesticides in Bangladesh from uh, a basic uh, overview. And then uh, I will follow up with some comments that I have based on information that I have received about some of the uh, biopesticides that are registered in Bangladesh, as well as some of the needs. And hopefully by the end, if I am not, uh, cannot stay longer, we can discuss what will be the next steps, okay? Uh, let me just start by saying the biopesticides, uh, it, you know, in the many years that I've been working with pest control, uh, we, I see the use and the availability of bio, biopesticides to be a more important component in terms of food safety, in terms of uh, occupational safety for uh, the application of pest control products. And that is a concept that is gaining more and more traction these days called smarter agriculture. And technology is advancing uh, quite rapidly in terms of providing safer pest control tools to farmers around the world. So, Biopesticides are very important today. And in my professional opinion, they will be more important in the future. And that's why this project that APARI, USDA, 
uh, FAS are working on with the uh, cooperation from the Bangladeshi officials, it will be very important in order to minimize the residues from the conventional chemicals that continue to be used and we continue to have a lot of dependence on, okay? So let me just start by saying, I need to thank uh, Dr. Michael Riverman from the IR4 uh, group in the United States, because much of the uh, slides that I will be presenting are based on a former presentation that was prepared by Dr. Riverman. He's still with us and, if we have any questions about biopesticides registrations in the future, you know, I believe that we can always reach out to him for his international expertise. So let's look at what biopesticides are. Uh, they are uh, described or identified as substances and organisms found in nature. So we tend to think about not, uh, natural products that are the basis for formulating some of the biopesticides. They have very unique modes of action. And they tend to be very selective in, in, uh, in many ways that you could, they may only affect the target pest uh, or selected uh, target pest and related organism. So in comparison to the conventional pesticides, uh, they may not have the broad spectrum for controlling uh, pests in, in the agricultural setting. They're usually used uh, in very low rates. Uh, they typically have what I call minimum risk. And uh, that's a concept that we need, uh, will be uh, addressing in, in, the, in the next slides. And obviously they are less toxic than conventional pesticides. And I think you should all know that these days we're trying to uh, reduce the reliance on the use of what is called the high or highly hazardous pesticides, which are called HHPs. So we're trying to make the transformation from the conventional pest control to a, what I call, quote unquote, the smarter pest control uh, programs that we may be able to, to implement. And in contrast to the conventional pesticides, uh, they do not necessarily are toxic to non-target organisms, including us humans, as well as uh, farmers that are applying some of the pesticides. For example, birds, beneficial insects. And I think you should know that now we have a, a lot of global concern about protecting our pollinators, fish, aquatic organisms, and other non-target plants, because some of the conventional pesticides may be also phytotoxic to some non-target plants, okay? And biopesticides, at least in my experience in the United States and in many other countries around the world, they are generally exempt from the requirement for establishing a maximum residue limit known as the MRL, okay? But there are some uh, I wouldn't say barriers, but some issues that are of concern about the adoption of biopesticides in the, in the agricultural setting. One of them is that they could be more expensive than some of the conventional chemicals, especially some of the older conventional pesticides, and may require more knowledge, more technical knowledge, how to best use a biopesticide within the context of an integrated pest management system. And uh, in some of the biopesticides, especially the microbial pesticides that I will be addressing, the control action may be a little bit retarded. They may not be as immediate as having to put a very toxic pesticide conventional chemical in the field, okay? So let's wanted to make sure that we have that we start with a regulatory definition of what a biopesticide is. And by canvassing a lot of the regulations around the world, there isn't like a harmonized definition as it is for a conventional pesticide, which is normally we adopt what the FAO definition would be. 
but in terms of biopesticides, it could be a microorganism that would be a microbial. It could be a biochemical, for example, a plant extract, a natural plant extract that can have pest control properties. Or now the recent technology is for a genetically modified organism that controls, repels, attracts, or otherwise manages a pest or modifies plant growth so that it may get uh, resistant to uh, pest damage. Now, keep that in mind that the fact that it controls, repels, attracts, and otherwise manages makes it into the general definition of a pesticide according to uh, the FAO uh, universally accepted definition of a pesticide. But furthermore, I would like to include something that is not included in the uh, FAO definition, that for a product to be classified as a biopesticide, at least in my experience in the, in the United States, it has to show that there are no adverse effects on human health and the environment. So that is probably the critical distinction that we should make between what is a conventional pesticide, mostly a chemical pesticide, versus a biopesticide. If we can clearly distinguish when we get an application, what is a conventional and a biopesticide, then we can apply what I will consider to be the reduced data requirements, as well as a quicker registration for promoting the use of biopesticides in our countries. Okay. So in terms of categories of biopesticides, now if we have clearly defined a product as a biopesticide, there are four major categories or five, depending on the source of information. And here again, there's not a universally or a global harmonized system for categorizing biopesticides. For example, some, some countries may exempt certain products from being uh, classified as a pesticide or a biopesticide. But in terms of the general categories, we can think of four that are considered. One is the microbial or the microbiological product. And in FAO and in the US, Environmental Protection Agency, known as EPA. That will include fungi, bacteria, viruses, uh, and bacterial, bac bacteriophage that can control a given pest, provided that that microbial does not create an adverse effect on human health and the environment. The biochemical classification is no, normally used by the Environmental Protection Agency, but FAO, uh, SAP classifies the biochemicals into two categories, botanicals, known, uh, also known as plant extracts, and semiochemicals. And we will look at some examples of semiochemicals. And in advance, I will tell you that that will include some of the pheromones, which are uh, uh, looking at the preliminary list of biopesticides registered in Bangladesh, they're already uh, being used by many of the farmers in Bangladesh. Then you have a category called the microbials. That would be like the beneficial insects or beneficial uh, par parasitoids. And if you think about the classical biological control, that's what we're talking about. That would be the uh, process of augmentation of the bio bio biological control uh, uh, beneficial insects that our parasitoids or predators or pests. Now, uh, as I will look into later, in the United States, we exempt the microbials from the uh, requirements of a, re of, of a registration. And then the newest category, I say newest, but has been, this technology has been with us now for a number of years, and it will be increasing in importance because of the biotechnological uh, research that is taking place. And 
at least in the United States, uh, we call them the Plan Incorporated Protectants, known as the PIPs normally. And normally that will include the BT, and that's the Bacillus thuringiensis, certain strains. And I've already noted that in Bangladesh, you have already registered some, some of the strains of the Bacillus thuringiensis. Okay. So, in terms of uh, the steps, this is based on the FAO uh, guidelines. Uh, whenever you receive like a dossier for a product to be registered as a biopesticide, you have the preliminary preparation. You have to determine the kind, the kind of product that is being requested for approval, whether it's a mi microbial, whether it's a biochemical, or whether it could be exempt. And then you have the pre-qualification. And this is something that if we continue to work in the development or the updating or improving the biopesticide registration in Bangladesh, uh, one of the things that uh, we'll be talking hopefully in the following workshops is how to, pro how to proceed if we can update the biopesticide regulations, how to proceed with the process of evaluating a product and making a determination that this is a biopesticide. So one of the things that we recommend is always for the registrant to contact the regulatory agency, present the product, of course, that will be protected under the trade secret at, at that time to explain the characteristics of the products and to make sure that it fits into the definition of a biopesticide. Okay. So let's look at some of the categories. <coughs> Excuse me. The microbial biological, uh, these are pathogens that uh, uh, attack uh, uh, mostly insect pests. Uh, they may survive, reproduce in the environment. The mode of action on target pests can include competition, uh, inhibition, use of target pests as a growth substrate, that means that will invade the body of, of, of a target pest, and uh, also control or kill the, the target pest. This is an example of a tar, uh, tarnished plant bug that has been uh, exposed to a, a fungus, uh, Bavaria baseana, and I've noticed in your preliminary list that you already have this my, microbial registered in Bangladesh and will actually control the, uh, this target pest. In the biochemical categories, if you remember there were two, there were the botanical or the plant extracts. Okay, those are normally uh, uh, compounds extracted from plants, from nature, provided that in the process of formulating, that means the concentrating, uh, purifying and blending that the chemical nature of the component is not intentionally modified or altered by chemical or microbial process. So the purity of the plant extract is an important characteristic for a botanical or plant extract uh, based pesticide. Okay. Then you have the semiochemicals. This is uh, something in terms of uh, a conversation for adults only, because it's gonna be looked into the sex and the reproductive uh, ability of some product uh, or the ability of some uh, chemicals to modify the uh, reproductive behavior, mostly of the insects. And that includes two categories, ones which are already are being used in Bangladesh uh, that modify the uh, sex and the uh, reproductive behavior of individuals of the same species. And I remember uh, when I started my career working on IPM, the first um, synthetic pheromones, and as you know, we cannot get pheromones from the, from the insects themselves, the first synthetic uh, pheromones for, was for the bow weevil, for control of the bow weevil. I still remember it was called glossy blur, blur. That's back in 1976. That can tell you 
a little bit of how old I, I am this is. And then the allelochemicals that are produced by individuals of one species that can modify the behavior of individual of a different species. Uh, for example, uh, they might uh, confuse, you know, the, uh, 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 the males uh, to the point that they cannot find the females. Uh, my wife tell me that that's a common occurrence for all males. And I hope I get a, a, a smile from you because it's very, very early in the morning here or late in the afternoon in, in Bangladesh. So this is a picture of uh, how pheromones are dispensed in terms of uh, in a trap. Uh, and uh, an important consideration is if the trap contains a pheromone, at least in the United States, it will be exempt for the registration, but the trap has to be manufactured in a regulated establishment. But some traps may contain an active ingredient as well as the pheromone. So the pheromone is used to attract the target pest. And the, if you add a conventional chemical within the trap, then the whole conception becomes a pesticide product and a conventional pesticide product, okay? So microbials uh, and EPA in the United States, we have determined that pest control organisms such as insect predators, nematodes, macroscopic parasites are exempt from the requirement for, of a registration. Uh, he, here we have a few examples. It's a parasitic wasp. Uh, we have lady beetles that are commercially available, but uh, working with some other countries, for example, working with some of the East African countries, uh, they decided to regulate the production and the commercial sale of microbials. And that is to protect the farmer uh, from uh, the production of the wrong type of uh, microbials. And furthermore, to make sure that uh, uh, registrants or uh, industry is not introducing new uh, predators or microbials that are not already endemic in, in their own countries. So there are several conditions by which uh, microbials might be regulated. Uh, that's something that uh, I would like to ask in, in subsequent workshops uh, with the officials to see how Bangladesh feels about the regulation of microbials. Now, the last category would be for the plant incorporated protectants. Uh, one of the first incorporate bacillus thuringiensis into the crops, mostly corn, cotton, and I think uh, soybeans, Bt soybeans, uh, in which there was a modification of, uh, uh, of the gene, uh, mostly through the uh, introduction of cry. Cry is the uh, component, the protein in the gene makeup that would be modified in the uh, DNA. But recent uh, technolo <coughs> I'm sorry, technology advancements, they talk about a technology known as CRISPR, which is very hard to uh, spell out. It's a cluster regulatory interspatial palindromic repeats that will be now modifying the RNA in the crops. So you have two components, one in terms of the DNA mod modification uh, uh, and the RNA. I see in the future that we're gonna see more crops in which the RNA has been modified in order to provide resistance or control attributes for any type of pest damage that may, may occur. And thinking about Bangladesh, I know that rice production uh, is very important. A lot of these small farmers are rice producers, but I have not seen any a CRISPR technology now for the rice production, but something that uh, you may have to look into the future. I don't know when that may be forthcoming. Okay, however, uh, let me just caution that not all naturally occurring products or, or organisms uh, 
may be non-toxic in terms of creating non-adverse effects on human health and the environment. Some of them could be toxic. So even when we receive an application for a biopesticide and we properly categorize the product as a biopesticide, we still need to evaluate the properties of the product to make sure that there are no adverse effects that the product will create on human health or the environment. And if there's some indications that may create some adverse effects, usually in very high doses, we have to ensure that at least that potential toxic effect or adverse effects mirrors what, may, what will happen if we or non-target organisms are exposed by natural means to that product. That would be the case of some, some of the plant extracts. There are some examples of products that may be based on naturally occurring products. However, uh, as you know, they are very toxic to human health and the environment. Okay. Based on the United States EPA experience, uh, there are some exemptions that we consider for products that are in the categories of biopesticides. For example, pheromones used in pheromone traps alone are exempt from the registration, provided that they are uh, manufactured or formulated in regulated establishment, because we still need to be able to control the quality of the pheromone and the trap. Uh, foods, some foods that are used to attract pests are exempt. That will be the case of, uh, say, uh, <clears throat> foods that may be used in traps and normally for rodents, for example, and then there might be a, a, a toxic uh, active ingredient. Uh, the food itself will be exempt from the regulations. There are other types of product like natural cedars, uh, normally used, they can be put in clothes and closets in the house, say to uh, control a moth, from uh, eating up your clothes, for example, or chips or panels, which are naturally wood panels, for example, that may be used for, wood con for pest control. And then there's another list of pesticides called the 25 list, 25 B list, which are the minimum risk pesticides. And there's a lot of uh, terpenes or fragrance or other things, uh, uh, like uh, cotton seed oil, I, I believe, soybean oil uh, that, that are uh, excluded uh, from uh, the requirement of a pesticide. And some devices, if they don't include, that will be traps uh, that don't include a conventional pesticide, okay? So some of the examples for the minimum risk pesticides that are exempt, uh, castor oil, cedar oil, cinnamon oil, citronella. Citronella is used for as a repellent for mosquitoes. Garlic, garlic oil as a repellent, mint and mint oil. So there might be other substances which uh, uh, do not cause uh, an adverse effect on human health and the environment that will be ex exempt from the requirement of a pesticide. However, the product itself has to meet some commercial regulations and how these products are being uh, made available in the marketplace. So it's not just a, a very broad uh, exemption, only exemption from the requirement of a pesticide. Okay. A bit of the biopesticide history, very quickly. <clears throat> One of the first, uh, Funguses that were uh, uh, identified as an insect pathogen, that means being able to provide insect control, was the Boveria basiana uh, in silkworm. Uh, actually, that was done, I believe, uh, in France. Uh, I think Augustine Bassi uh, was one of the first that identified the use of a pathogen for uh, controlling. Uh, 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 
uh, an insect, a pest. Bacillus thuringiensis was discovered um, many, many uh, years ago. And uh, of course, uh, the, the first bacillus was uh, designated as BT, but these, the currently BT biopesticide registered products are actually specific strains of the BT. For example, I've noticed in the preliminary list that you have BT uh, 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 is the, bear, uh, the, the variety Kustaski, which is one of the strains for the BT. And not all of the BT's strains are non-toxic. So we have to be able, be able to distinguish not only the BT, but also the strain of the BT. And in the United States, the first BT type product or the first biopesticide uh, that was registered, the first microbial was Bacillus papillae. But uh, at that time in the United States, we do, did not have a specific biopesticide requirement. So we was actually registered as a conventional microbial pesticide. But most of the products that are commercially available, at least in the United States, are based on BT products. Uh, I think in the United States, uh, they probably, the BT products contain about maybe more than 50% to 60%. That's, that's my understanding. And you have several varieties. Kustaski uh, for caterpillars that uh, I'm gonna be showing you a preliminary list that I, that I was provided. And some of the latest ones are the Israelensis, Tenebro Tenebroinis, and the Aizawi for a number of uh, other uh, insect pests that are very important for some of the crops. So just a uh, difference uh, for the uh, cotton bollworm, the Helicoverpa variety. Uh, so the difference between when uh, cotton has been, or a BT application has been made, you actually retard the growth of a cotton bollworm uh, that uh, in fact uh, may not be affect, uh, may not be, be able to uh, uh, affect the, the cotton ball. Yeah, and, and, and try to minimize uh, uh, the damage that the cotton bollworm can cause on, on cotton production. Yeah. Uh, you should know about this tree. It's very common. I think it's originated in Southeast Asia. That's the neem tree. And out of the neem tree, there is an insect insecticide that is used as a repellent, as well as as an insect control basis. When you have the uh, neem fruit, The neem fruit is being pressed, uh, being uh, created into a cake. Then out of the cake, you extract the uh, neem oil and you do further extraction of an active ingredient. This is a biopesticide by the designation of as a di directing. And you already have this biopesticide being used uh, in, in Bangladesh. Yeah. So this is the mode of action for this uh, neem-based product. This will be like a botanical kind of a biopesticide in which uh, you interrupt the molting, the metamorphosis and development of the female reproductive system. And uh, what you're doing uh, is you, the action of this active ingredient is to develop a deformed uh, kind of the target pest incapable of feeding, dispersing, and, and reproducing. Yeah. Uh, there might be some other types of organic herbicides. I don't think uh, this may be necessarily available, available in the agricultural setting. You don't wanna be spraying vinegar in a lot of your agricultural fields, but uh, for some household uses, when you have pockets of weeds, for example, crabgrass, which they have the ability to grow anywhere. Oh. Uh, excuse me, something happened to my... Uh, 
you went into a propaganda mode, which I, uh, you might be able to use vinegar for very specific, uh, uh, which is uh, a way to control some of the weeds because of the acetic acid that kills. So uh, it actually controls the growth of potential be. Then you have the gibberellic acid, uh, which uh, was investigated uh, uh, to control the uh, fooling the seedling disease uh, in rice in Japan, Taiwan, and, and throughout the Asian continent. But a gibberellic acid also has the property to be, to be like a, a plant growth regulator because it may increase the size or the production or the yield of some of the crops. And that would be the case of grapes, which are being exposed to gibberellic acid. You see the difference in the size of the fruit for some of the crops. Pheromones uh, has been used for a number of years. It's chemical sickness, sense that insects, this will be the case of the semiochemicals. Uh, pheromones is one of the uh, classes. In the United States, we exempt pheromones from the requirement of a pesticide if only the pheromone has been used in a given, in a given trap. And there might be other allelochemicals related to pheromones or, or being in the category of semi-chemicals that will create like mating confusion, uh, uh, they will be creating like mate disruption techniques that can be used. Uh, okay. Then for fruit flies, we have pheromones for a number of the crops. You do have it also in terms of uh, 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 the list of preliminary biopesticides that are available in Bangladesh. Uh, this is, are some of the uh, fruit flies pheromones that are available in the market. This will be in Hawaii. Uh, because they're trying to control a lot of the tropical fruit flies uh, and by, by means of uh, biopesticide control. Yeah. Then you have the microbials, in when you have the infection or the parasiticism of the uh, target pest, as we saw the picture of the uh, plant bug that was being um, overwhelmed by a fungi or a pathogen, you have insects that are microbial biopesticides that can act as a biopesticide uh, where, uh, where uh, some of them may adhere to the cuticle of the target pest and they will germinate and produce enzymes that attack or dissolve the cuticle. And then you have the competitive exclusion microbial biopesticides such as uh, trichoderma that occupies the pathogens and prevent diseases such as pythium, Fusarium, Rhizoctonia, and others from getting into the roots of some of the crops that are being treated, okay? Uh, just a few more slides. And uh, I understand that Sassi's PhD defense was in terms of uh, the post-harvest uh, toxicity of aflatoxin. Uh, aflatoxin occurs naturally in many of the agricultural fields. And there are two, several strains of aflatoxins. Some of them are toxic and some of them are not toxic or are uh, toxigenic. So that do not produce the aflatoxin B1 strain, which is the main cause of the aflatoxin uh, contamination or exposure to toxic aflatoxin that we see post-harvest. Yeah. So aflatoxin flavors is the one that occurs widely on a range of crops. Uh, and one of the ways to control that, something that was discovered or identified a couple of decades ago, at least in the United States, is that there were some atoxygenic strains of the, of the A flavors that can be applied and they can outcompete the uh, aflatoxin B1 strain. And therefore, by outcompeting, it can minimize the amount of aflatoxin, the toxic aflatoxin uh, strain that can be carried from the field into the post-harvest uh, status or, or some of the uh, some of the uh, uh, crops. 
uh, mostly in terms of the cereal, cereal grains, as well as many other vegetable crops that will contain some of the uh, aflatoxin B1 or the flavors uh, to toxic strains. And many decades ago, there was a strain known as the A flavors 36 that has been working in the United States in commercial fields that uh, by introducing this uh, atoxygenic strain, uh, there are no reports of any adverse health effects. And furthermore, it has shown some type of control for the toxic strain of the aflatoxin. That means minimize the potential for the presence of aflatoxin uh, post-harvest. Yeah. Uh, this, is, uh, this is not to do a propaganda, but this is uh, the uh, label of some of the products. And I just wanted to show that uh, this type of product is now being registered in other countries. Uh, including Nigeria about three or four years ago, in which many of the studies were waived because they looked at the literature or the data studies that were submitted and reviewed by the United States. So therefore, in Nigeria, through work with the IR4 and the United States and the Institute for Technological Advancement, they were able to register Aflasafe, which is the name of the product in Nigeria, as a way to control or provide uh, post-harvest, uh, well, infill and post-harvest control of aflatoxin. So, and because of the reduced data uh, set that was required, they were able to register this product very quickly. So that's finished, an overview is very generic, but in terms of biopesticides, uh, I will be looking at some of the key questions that I intend to work with the Bangladeshi officials. A few of the questions that I have is, is there a specific biopesticide regulation in Bangladesh, whether it might be a separate regulation or whether it will be included uh, as a sub part of the general pesticide regulation, which I know uh, exists in Bangladesh. Now, does the existing biopesticide regulations need to be updated or amended? That's something that I need to hear from, from the Bangladeshi officials, as well as how, how to do that. What is the extent of the amendment or the updating that we need to do? What regulatory capacity building topics are needed by you to implement this regulation? Uh, remember that technology innovation changes there might be new products. And for every pesticide product or biopesticide product, the properties might be unique. So therefore, uh, it's important to know how to evaluate. Now, understand, or I understand that in Bangladesh, you may not have like uh, 60 technical people, which we do in the United States, just working on biopesticide registration. We may have a few, uh, and, and this, this few will have to know everything that there is to know about biochemicals, microbials, maybe some of the uh, new technologies, pheromones, and all of that. So one of the things that we need to know is what regulatory capacity buildings are needed from a biopesticide registration component to help you uh, promote the use of biopesticides and be able to um, properly evaluate when you get a dossier on an application of a biopesticide. And there are many more questions about whether there's a process for fast tracking biopesticide registration, provided that the data set that we request is complete. Uh, but if it is subject to a, a reduced data set requirement, for example, there may not be a need for very expensive uh, chronic toxicity uh, studies conducted in rat and mice because if we have some certainty and that is reasonable certainty that there are no chronic toxic effects on humans we might be able to uh, to waive some of the requirements but it has to be that has to be codified into the biopesticide regulations so those are things that I hope to work 
with you in uh, in the next in the next month as well as in the following year. Okay. So I will stop with that and share one more one more document with some comments. Give me a minute, please. Uh, Sassy, have I stopped sharing? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Can you see my screen now? Not yet. Oh. Oh, so I see I'm having a problem trying to. We can't see your screen uh, as well. In the meantime, would you like to uh, have some questions for us? Or uh, we have few participants. Uh -oh. Yeah, we can see your screen now. Uh, we can see the Zoom. Yeah, we can also okay. see what. Can you, can you see that list of registered biopesticides? Yes, we can see that. List. Okay. I wanted to share with you some preliminary comments that I have about a preliminary list of biopesticides that are registered in Bangladesh. Uh, and my comments are not a critique, nor, but one, one of the uh, my goals was to be able to understand what is uh, the current process of biopesticide registrations in Bangladesh. So I was provided this preliminary list of the biopesticides. At this point, I don't know whether it is complete, but at least it give me an idea that a lot of work is already being conducted by PPW in, in Bangladesh. So to my surprise, abegmectin was one of the first products that was considered a biopesticide in Bangladesh. And in the United States, abegmectin is actually classified as a conventional insecticide. And I know that abegmectin related to abermectin is a natural product that is a fermented product from uh, the soil bacterium, which is streptomyces. However, uh, if you remember one of my first slides in the definition is that for a product to be, this would be in case of a uh, microbial, uh, yeah, fermentation of a soil bacterium, it would be a microbial pesticide. It has to show no adverse effects 
on human health and the environment. However, when EPA review the information of, of, uh, about abacmectin, uh, some of the studies show that it's highly toxic to fish and aquatic organisms, uh, highly toxic to bees being an insecticide. And at high doses, it may have some uh, adverse effects on human health and therefore uh, it was not uh, included or categorized or classified as a biopesticide in the United States. So these are some of the questions that we hope to be able to address with you uh, in the uh, months to come. There's another product that has very low toxicity, uh, although it might be a irritant to the eye and the skin for humans, for the applicators, uh, and especially children, if children will be exposed to the product. Uh, this is uh, uh, an active ingredient called spinosad or spinosad. And spinosad has uh, been classified in some countries as a biopesticide. However, in the United States, uh, although it has very minimal toxicity, is still highly toxic to oysters. That will be an aquatic organism and highly toxic to bees. Therefore, spinosad or spinosad, which is also based on the fermentation of a soil bacterium, is not properly or has not been classified by EPA as a biopesticide. So please keep, keep in mind in how we classify or uh, categorize a biopesticide because that's gonna be, be very important from a regulatory context, okay? If we go down the list, you have uh, some of the, uh, that will be some of the pheromones. Uh, I am very glad that there are many pheromones. Hopefully they're being used by the farmers in terms of pest monitoring, uh, pheromone lures, uh, azadiraquine, which is the neem type, uh, uh, a product that will be a botanical. I think there was a mistake here because uh, alpha cypermethrin was included and alpha cypermethrin will be like a conventional uh, pyrethroid and that should be uh, uh, categorized and evaluated as a, a conventional chemical. Now, now I, I did see a combination of methyl eugenol, which is a uh, biochemical, plus avagmectin. And I'm still trying to find, I don't have any example in, in which you have a combination, at least in the US market, of a biopesticide and a conventional. As I said, the United States avagmectin will be a conventional. I don't know the type of synergies that may occur or whether uh, how effective the combination of a conventional and a biopesticide may be, okay? So there might be uh, many details that hopefully we can uh, be discussing. Uh, this is the uh, foligen, which is a biopesticide. And I understand that the foam armyworm, which is a Spodoptera frugiperda has been uh, an issue uh, in, uh, in Bangladesh. I think uh, the for army worm was a uh, South American type uh, native uh, uh, insect pest. Uh, it came to the United States and in 1996, I believe it was detected in Nigeria and it went through Africa, all of the uh, 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 middle, central and South Africa, went to uh, India. And I think he has now appeared uh, in, in Bangladesh, has been there for a number of years. So foligen is actually a biopesticide that is effective for the control of the form of worm. Yeah. So you have other, uh, that will be uh, pheromones, methyl eugenol. Uh, I don't know some of the compounds, for example, the sericonin or the matrin. I think bi biotrin, I know that biotrin, it is a biopesticide at least I remember the commercial name. You have lures, uh, trichoderma. Uh, trichoderma, I, I would imagine that this could be like a bio biological control. 
Boveria bassiana, uh, as we indicated, is um, microbiological. I was very surprised to see very few uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, and especially now in combination with abamectin that was registered. There were only like two, I believe, uh, BT products that were registered in uh, uh, in uh, uh, in Bangladesh. And singnamycin, I think this is a Chinese type of a uh, uh, related to the streptomycin, oxytetracyclone that will be in terms of the anti antibiotic and antibiotics in the United States are not necessarily classified as biopesticides because one of the things that we would like to prevent in the United States is the resistance, especially human resistance to antibiotics. So I don't know about the composition, but uh, the uh, registration of antibiotics for pest control in the United States, it's available. However, it's further to a second scrutiny uh, working with uh, uh, the Center for Disease Control to make sure that we are not accelerating the potential resistance if humans are going to be ingesting uh, through the uh, presence of antibiotics in crops, because it might be used in apples, some of the uh, palm fruits, as well as other crops uh, um, into our diet, okay? So that would basically finish my presentation. We have a few more minutes for some of the questions. I know that there were some chats. Yes, uh, Luis, maybe I could help you read the questions in the chat. Uh, how the farmers of Bangladesh will accept this advanced technologies and how can we take these to the farmers? So that was one question from Habibu Rahman. Okay, this is a very important question. In working with the APARI project and the USDA FAS, we have a component that is pretty much going to be working side by side with the regulatory development because we may be able to identify biologicals and promote the uh, 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 registration of biopesticides. But uh, as you know very well, the farmer has to accept as the comment is made, as well as adopt this type of technology. And that requires uh, a process, programs for extension, education, and we're gonna be working through a party with what is called the development of soft skills, how to transmit this information to the farmers, as well as other type of media so that they can adopt and believe me, it's not processed. In the United States, it took many years uh, when the entire concept of IPM started in the 1970s. Uh, we've been working with the states and significant work with the states and the universities. Such would be the case of Dr. Kevin Rice, which is also a participant from the University of Missouri, promoting integrated pest control management and the adoption of what I call, again, smarter technologies, yeah. Thank you, Luis, for the answer. So would you like to proceed with our next agenda item and then get back to discussion or uh, how you want us to proceed next? Since yeah. you are going uh, uh, there was a question about botanicals, uh, for example, the neem extracts. Yeah, like, so uh, we also uh, have Kevin, maybe uh, after you answer, Kevin also could supplement. Yeah. So the question on botanicals or, uh, or selective or not, I mean, uh, botanicals work only against target insect pests or also against uh, non-target organisms like predator and uh, parasitoids. So that is a question, yeah. Luis, please go ahead. Yeah, like botanicals, uh, for the most part, if we have done our evaluation, uh, we will probably register, at least in the United States, as very selective to a certain pest. If we see that uh, it has uh, toxic effects on non-target organisms, then, then we will consider to be, for example, as, uh, as conventional pesticides. 
and it will have to be reviewed in terms of the entire data set that is commissioned. I can think, for example, uh, natural pyrethrins. Natural pyrethrins are botanicals in essence. However, because their mode of action or the toxic mode of action is very analogous or similar to these synthetic pyrethroids, they are not considered to be biopesticides. And we have to uh, look at all of the uh, ecotoxicity and environmental fate data, as well as the human uh, data for the natural pyrethrins. And they are actually classified uh, for cumulative risk assessment uh, with the synthetic pyrethroids. So it all depends as to what might be some of the toxic effects uh, for botanicals or plant extract to be properly classified, whether it would be a conventional or a botanical or a, a biopesticide. Thank you, Mr. Luis. Uh, Dr. Kevin, would you like to add to that? Uh, sure, sure. sure. Um, yeah, so there, the question was about um, why neem oils or biopesticides might work better on pests. So things like neem oil actually work. The mode of action is it suffocates the spiracles, the breathing organisms uh, for, for insects. And it works really well on aphids and caterpillars that are soft body insects. And it doesn't really work for the adults like beetles and bees. Um, and it won't work on stink bugs. So it, 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 it works for specific pests like white flies and aphids really well for neem oil. Um, but it's not going to affect uh, the predators. And then some of the other botanicals that uh, Luis mentioned uh, will coat the leaf. Um, and, and the predators aren't consuming that leaf material, so they aren't ingesting that chemical. Um, so it's more poisonous to the specific target organism that's chewing on the plant. Um, and then as Louise said also, uh, they're more specific, so they're, they're a lot better um, than the broad spectrum pesticides. Now, one caveat is if you're using neem oil or some of those biopesticides, if you increase the concentration too high, it will have a negative effect on predators. So that's why you have to follow the label instructions uh, that with the rate. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Thank you so much, Dr. Kevin, for the clarity. Uh, I would like to read another question, Ms. Lewis. Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Abdul Kaimun uh, asks, I want to know the biopesticide and green pesticides are same or not. Some green pesticides are not plant or biological origin, but safe for non-target organ organisms with high efficiency against pests. So that is a question. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah I don't recall hearing the term a green, pesti green pesticide. Uh, it could be the same as a biopesticide, but normally in the international literature, uh, in the international regulatory context, we don't use the term green pesticides because the connotation of the term green means that it's a safe pesticide and not all pesticides are safe. So uh, that would be my only comment in response to that. Uh, the next question is, are all biocontrol agents not suitable? Uh, fungi and, vir and viruses? Yeah, uh, keep in mind that when we're talking about microbial, especially fungi and viruses, we have to make sure that uh, they don't provide or they are not going to be causing a toxic uh, effect on human health and the environment. There are some fungi, especially some strains or, or viruses, some strains of the viruses that may be very toxic. We don't want to be able to approve the registration. So the, we have to make sure that we clearly identify the organism that we would like to register or approve for registration and be, make, make sure even with a reduced data set that they are not going to be causing an adverse effect because some of them may. And if we have a regulatory biopesticide bio framework in which we go through tiers because normally the evaluation or the data requirements are based on tiers. The first tier will be the basic studies, maybe some toxic, some, some of the ecotoxicity, and if they no, show no effects, as well as the six pack, then we may say, okay, this is a biopesticide that may not cause 
But if we have uh, some clues that may create a toxic effect, we may have to go into tier two, tier three, up to tier four. And by tier four, we might as well just classify as a conventional and, uh, and ask for the entire uh, uh, list of the data requirements for us. Exactly the same as a conventional pesticides. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Uh, yeah. I am. Uh, I'm. I am glad to uh, know that there are biopesticide regulations in in the existing system. Uh, what I need to know, something that uh, we need to engage now in terms of a smaller group, is whether they need to be updated whether they need to be amended, they need to, uh, whether they need to be recreated, I don't know. That's something that I would like to explore now with a, a group of Bangladeshi officials, yeah. yeah. So the uh, next question is, uh, biopesticides are not able to work at above 20 degrees Celsius. So how, what uh, best mode of action of biopesticide uh, could be used for, for the sugar cane field? Yeah, this is a very specific question. I, I, I don't know, uh, Kevin. Uh, uh, yeah, so that that is a great question, and there 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 are concerns with the level of uh, temperatures with some of the biopesticides. That's why we want to do the efficacy training and or or the efficacy trials that we're going to do. And one thing to remember, we are not trying to replace all conventional pesticides. So we just want to use the biopesticide at the time closer to harvest to reduce the, uh, the uh, residue levels to, to, to increase trade. Um, so uh, that's part of it, but the, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and then lastly, there have been issues with, or there has been studies that have shown that the fungus do work in uh, in countries like Pakistan, they've done where you wouldn't expect the fungus maybe to work because it's so dried, but that small microclimate and the barrier and the humidity that the plants have under the leaves actually does provide sometimes enough uh, of a different sort of microclimate for the uh, biopesticide to work correctly. But again, that, that's, a, that's a great point, and that's some of the things that we need to discuss in our, in our groups uh, with, with uh, the scientists and uh, in Bangladesh, uh, when we meet with our small groups in the training. Um, but our efficacy trials will hopefully uh, answer some of those questions later on. Thank you, Dr. Kevin. Uh, so there is another question from uh, Abdul Kaimu. Kaimu. Uh, so yes. are uh, amino oligosaccharines products biopesticides or not? Some of the questions are very specific, but uh... I understand that amino oligosaccharines are also based on fermentations, uh, microbial fermentations. And I think in the United States, yes, I think it is registered as a biopesticide, yeah. Uh, at least. At yeah. least that's the information, but uh, I, I would probably have to check on that, yeah. Sure, and thank you. Uh, just to add to Kevin's response is that about uh, how biopesticides work. Remember that when we approve the use of our biopesticides, we also approve a label. And the label has conditions of use, how the biopesticides can be properly used. And in some cases, by working with extension and the researchers, how they fit into an IPM system. In the, in the case of the temperature, if there's a biopesticide, uh, that can be uh, used or cannot, it's not effective if the temperature is above 20 degrees, that should be explicitly stated in, in, in the label. Do not apply these pesticides when temperatures are expected to exceed, to exceed 20, 20 degrees centigrade, for example. So there are other ways to be able to determine the proper use of a biopesticide, not only in the field, in a single application, but also within the context of a, an IPM system. Uh, is there any effective bioherbicide available in any rice 
uh, I, yeah, I wouldn't know at this time. That's another question that I will have to research. I know that uh, we have the International Research Institute. I think uh, the headquarters is in the Philippines. I probably have to check whether ERI, which is the International Research Institute, is doing any research or identifying any type of bio biopesticide or bioherbicide that can be used for, for rice. Yeah. Okay. So I have two questions that we have to. We have to uh, Dr. Habibu Rahman. Uh, would you like to ask a question? Please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, could you hear me clearly? Yeah, we can hear you well. Uh, thank you. Thank you once again for giving me the floor to say something about uh, this biopesticide regulation workshop for the first time. And I am very much happy to be here. Uh, uh, thank you, Luis Saguema, for your uh, clear idea about the biopesticides uh, before us. Actually, we have a lot of knowledge about biopesticides. And you have rightly said that MRL uh, barrier or high pesticide resistance in our agricultural produces definitely a barrier for exports. Or actually, Bangladesh is an agro-based country, and we have lots of agro producers, but we could not export this product to another countries for foreign currency due to the high pesticide residues in the product. So this project definitely uh, definitely a good platform to minimize the pesticide residues in our agricultural producers. So some of the questions have already been uh, answered by you, and I uh, knew that. But I would like to say about that the biopesticide registration, or pesticide registration, actually, this is the sole right of the PPW. And here presents the Honorable Director, Abu Said Mia, Plant Protection Wing, and he will uh, tell uh, details about that, but I would like to mention one thing that uh, Ordinance 1971 uh, is the first ordinance passed by our National Assembly of Bangladesh, and then it is revised in 19 July 2018 in our Bangladesh Gazette and the Act Number 24 in 2018. And in this Act, I could say in this Act, and the Ordinance Number Four. They are the clear idea about the pesticide registration, the renewal, their uh, periods of the renewal, periods of the activation, everything is mentioned here. But I read this uh, act or ordinance clearly. It is written in Bengali, but you can find in English versions in the website also. But okay. there is a clear cut idea about the biopesticide registration. So far, the, this is correctly, correctly said about the, uh, yes, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, Mr. Lewis will be leaving. So if you have any questions, could you please? Okay, okay all right. So my question is the cyphermethrin, he, he mentioned, abamectin, spinosets, and alpha Actually, This is not that it's confidential. It could not be a biopesticide. So our pesticide act or pesticide should be updated to the biopesticide stations. And second thing, already I mentioned, the, our farmers are mostly tired, they do not know the use of these biopesticides because they are habituated in pesticide registrations. So I think uh, with the uh, help of the PW, so uh, our, this project could be taken uh, for method demonstration, result demonstrations, and efficacy. If the farmers just accept that this is better, then they will accept this. So this is my comment, actually not a question. And this is the question. I think everything will be clear if our uh, director, Professor uh, uh, Dr. Abu yeah. will give that yeah, thank, about. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. And that is the purpose of this whole project. Uh, it's not an easy project because there are many parts and components. And remember that this is the first workshop, regulatory workshop. And the regular co component is just one component of many other parts, soft skills, residue mitigation, identification, promotion, and all of that. So uh, our objective was not to be able to address every specific detail or question in the first workshop, but to help us understand the complexity of this project. So we have many months to work on that. 
And I'm looking very much forward to working with the Bangladeshi officials and the project uh, uh, implementers in, in, in this endeavor. Yeah. And thank you very much. I have to leave. I apologize for leaving, but hopefully Dr. Ravi, Sasi, and Ire, we may have a, a few more minutes for you guys to determine what would be the next steps. I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Lewis, uh, for the great presentations. We had so many interactions and so many questions for you. Uh, I think participants were really interested in what you were saying and still we have so many questions and uh, we really appreciate your time. So with that, uh, I would like to uh, mention the participants that we have given a link for the Google form of the pre-test evaluation. If you all could take that, uh, it will we will really appreciate it. And following this discussion, we will be also sending a post-training evaluation quiz by tomorrow through your email. Once you finish all these two tests, we will be sending you the, your certificates uh, to you, to your registered uh, email ID. So I request you to kindly take the test. So far, we only got uh, five responses from the participants. So please uh, click on the link in the chat box and uh, take the test. Uh, with that, I would like to now invite Dr. Varaprasad uh, to proceed with the today's workshop. Dr. Varaprasad, over to you. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, thank you very much. And uh, there were some uh, hands risen. If anybody wants to speak, I think uh, since anyway the time limitation of Louis is over, he has gone. We may allow uh, some hands risen before I give my uh, closing remarks. Yeah, Thank so you. we have Dr. Aminul Islam. Uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Shashi, uh, for giving me the floor. Actually, I, I would like to know a uh, few things. Uh, like many people uh, of Bangladesh, we are working on developing new biopesticides, especially microbial biopesticide against uh, disease and insect control. But uh, I just I would like to know whether we have any facilities in Bangladesh to test the study to give the registration of this uh, native product, or just we are uh, giving registration uh, only the imported product from our side. And uh, yeah, if we don't have any facilities of this study of this microbial product in Bangladesh, then how can we develop these facilities to give because we have a lot of product, but we are not getting registration of our native source of microbial products. This is my question, yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mainal, for this question. Very important question. And this will be partly addressed through this project also. And uh, uh, wherever we, we also plan in this project to field efficacy tests of the biopesticides and also lab efficacy and uh, testing the biopesticides developed by the research institutes and universities, uh, capacities will be addressed. Actual physical, capa physical capacity, physical instruments and laboratory availability, human resource will be first addressed. So this is a very important question that you have asked. Definitely, uh, partly it will be attended in this project, which is just a short term project, but definitely those things will be carried forward for uh, addressing them. Thank you very much. Dr. Thank Mainu. you. Thank you, Dr. Mainul and Dr. Varaprasad. So I would like to request uh, Dr. Abdul Kaim uh, to ask your question, please. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to just share one information is that uh, still now the monitoring data of Bangladesh, the residue is below 20% of our uh, food sample. So it's not too much like uh, it uh, discuss uh, in many forum. It's not too much. The level is 24. But uh, my question is, uh, like Bangladesh is a tropical country and a uh, huge population with very sm small uh, agricultural land. We need huge production in very small land. In this case, biopesticide, if you say against the plant pest, is uh, not uh, too much effective to control uh, effectively. But uh, in pesticide, we use uh, highly toxic, uh, is uh, also uh, concerned for uh, safe food. So in some countries, developing countries, at first choosing the high efficiency and low risk uh, pesticide, like uh, green pesticide, safe pesticide, then they maybe go to use biopesticide. 
why you, we are turning from chemical pesticide to biopesticide di directly. At first, we, I think uh, we can also use green pesticide uh, to uh, keep our yield in the same level. Then we maybe amply uh, replace the biopesticide. It's my just opinion. And in uh, registration of a biopesticide, it's an efficiency of one or two years is enough because in some country uh, experiments, maybe after two or three or four years, the biopesticide is not working against the target test. So how many years of a field evaluation is needed uh, uh, for a registration of biopesticide is important. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abdul Kayum for the very, very pertinent question. Uh, yes, this project also, uh, as already Dr. Louis clarified, we are not trying to replace the pesticides. That's a underlined, bold, kindly understand. This biopesticides, this workshop or this project does not uh, promote replacing pesticides with the biopesticides. But the biopesticides have a potential for increasing the exports if you use it in the just pre-harvest period. At what stage and all those things, that is what we need to work out. That is where some field experiments are also being planned. So your idea of uh, uh, using the effective pesticides in the initial crop stages is very much agreed and is part of the project. Thank you very much for that concern. We agree with you. The second part of your question is uh, regarding the how many years of data. So it's actually uh, my experience is mostly biopesticides doesn't work, uh, not because of the lack of data, but because of quality in the market that is available, their survival when they sell it and the shelf life. These are more important rather than the effectiveness originally might be good, but if you supply in the market, which is uh, uh, not live biopesticide or doesn't have the toxin content as expected, then it doesn't work. So, but uh, it's a very pertinent question again, uh, that the pesticide, biopesticide registration process is under review now. So you can give definitely your input how really we can make it more effective by bringing some changes in the registration process. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdul Kayum. I hope I addressed your question. Thank you so much, Dr. Varaprashad. Uh, we will take the final question from Dr. Nirmal Kumar Datta. Uh, please uh, unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Thank you, Dr. Sashir, for giving me the chance. Actually, this is Nirmal Kumar Datta. I am the head entomology division, Bari. Bari means the Bangladesh Agriculture Research Institute. You know that it is the largest research institute and uh, do, uh, do, uh, actually conducting research on more than 211 crops. Actually, we test the efficacy of the biopesticides in the field and recommend to the Department of Agriculture registration, uh, agriculture extension for the registration. Actually, you know that in Bangladesh from 2010, from 2010, it is the, the biopesticide registration procedures are there. Actually, our present government amended pesticide rules 1985 in 2010, and then the registration procedure of the biopesticides was incorporated. And from the 2012, the first biopesticide registration was given. This is the, actually the history of Bangladesh biopesticides. And what Luis was telling, actually, Luis gave a very good presentation that Luis was telling that the abomectin, actually, it's a really, he nicely discussed the uh, the issue of abamectin and spinosad. Actually, abamectin, you know that who classified it as a highly hazardous pesticide. And last meeting in a DAE in Department of Agriculture Extension in Bangladesh, we scientists and the extension officials discussed the issue of abamectin. I think that in future there are uh, there will be some dis uh, decisions regarding the fate of abamectin. Actually, whether it would be treated as conventional or biopesticides. Actually, I think that Bangladesh government, that is Department of Agriculture extension will take decision soon. So we are aware, uh, actually, we are aware about the issue. This is all about my just comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nirmal Kumar. Uh, Dr. Varaprashad, we have no more questions and it is over to you for providing the way forward. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. 
uh, I am uh, very much delighted the quality of interactions by the participants. It's excellent. And uh, first I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Abu Sayyid Miyaji and also uh, our uh, uh, Subrata Kumar Das for uh, really making this workshop possible uh, in a very short notice, at a very, very short notice. And that's one of the reasons why we shared the pre-test very late, we have sent it. So I request that uh, uh, if you need five or 10 minutes more, you can take it, but then uh, it's a very simple question. Just only you have to choose uh, either true or false or multiple choice, nothing to write. It's a Google link already provided by Shashi. And uh, all of you, if you provide, what will happen? It will help us to increase the level of the content, what Bangladesh needs, instead of uh, going into basic. This first workshop is only a basic workshop, an overview, and a very good uh, competent people are available in the, from the uh, Bangladesh, uh, both from the department as well as universities and research sector. So I am very sure that when you answer, please, uh, even if some people are not able to uh, do the pre-test, uh, please do it post-test. Please do not feel that it is to test your knowledge. It is actually useful for us, for the APARI and for the USDA to decide in which way to go. This will help us. So kindly uh, fill up both the pre and post test. And as Sashi has said, that after uh, receiving these things, uh, the certification of uh, uh, your uh, participation in this workshop will also be sent to your registered mail ID. Now coming to the next steps, the most important thing is Louis has given some questions. So that will decide uh, the directions based on the answers and uh, the uh, input given by all of you. This important August group of uh, both PPW will actively participate and all the research sector. And we are extremely happy to inform you, APARI has made some provision to bring a formal arrangement, formal interaction arrangement with the research sector and universities and PPW, RPQW. So this is being followed up. And before the end of this project, we are sure that we will make a very formal relationship with the uh, collaborators and uh, extremely happy that uh, the PPW has been very effectively brought out national team. So this national team and uh, formal relationships and the, your input on the questions put by Louis will decide us, and you already indicated certain things, which is being recorded. We will take note of your suggestions, whether it is the amendment of the Pesticide Act, or whether it is the efficacy studies for the local products. So this uh, strength already is available. If there are certain gaps, which we will address it. And uh, the uh, different areas uh, that what you have addressed uh, will be taken note of and the future workshops and future activities will be taken. Already we have an action plan wherein uh, the residue studies uh, by the research institutes and the universities being involved, they are being planned. And at the moment uh, for the leaf greens and from the other project, Chilis is also there. With these two, we are moving ahead. But uh, uh, your input and interaction, it's uh, um, you are most welcome to in, uh, put it to the uh, Dr. S.K. Das or PPW. You can, in fact, give your input. Based on that, we can revise our work plan also. So the another point, uh, what uh, Nirmal Kumar Datta has also made point, and just I would like to uh, reiterate that uh, the, it is not the origin from where the biopesticide is coming, but it, it's uh, effect on the human beings and environment will decide whether it is a biopesticide or not. So examples are evermectin, spinosads, pyrethroids, so many examples are there. And also the act should have a provision that if something we have done it, uh, you can also deregulate it. That means it cannot be, uh, the registration of the biopesticides can be cancelled. That kind of provision also is required. We are also studying the plant quarantine act for some amendment. Similarly, you can also give some suggestions, whether it is in the Pesticide Act in 
any amendments are required as one of the professors has very clearly brought out some points. So this, our next steps is conducting the research in the lab and in the field for a biopesticide efficacy and also residue studies. This is already planned. And amendments are also part of the project, mainly for plant quarantine act. We will look forward for your input in the pesticide act. At least we will bring the major issues. And in the capacity building, uh, look at the questions what Luis has said, in which area you need more capacity. And if you mention that and communicate it to the PPW, those will be given priority. And I am just talking on behalf of uh, the team leader, international team leader, Dr. Jason. And uh, thanks to Dr. Jason that he has given me this opportunity. He was busy otherwise, could not come here. And thanks a lot to the, uh, Dr. Luis for an excellent presentation. And I also congratulate all the participants for making this workshop very, very lively with a wonderful questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sasi, for your good moderation. That's it I want to say. Thank you so much, Dr. Varaprasad. Uh, now I request all the participants to quickly turn on your video for a photo session before we go to the vote of thanks. We are still waiting for a few more participants to turn on your camera and then we will have a quick photo session, please. Please tell us when to smile. Sure. <laughs> I'm still waiting for a few participants to turn on their camera. Yes, so three, two, one, please. Uh, I'm also getting help from my colleague Nui uh, Tharatip to get us pictures. Yeah. A few more seconds and one more. Uh, we'll go now. Three, two, one, cheese. We are going to the second screen to get few participants. Thank you so much, everyone, for your uh, time. And now I would like to invite Dr. Subrata Kumar Das to provide vote of thanks. Dr. Subrata Kumar Das. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Sasi. Good morning and good evening to all dignitaries and expert teams in the first Biopesticide Regulatory Workshop for promoting biopesticide registration in Bangladesh and pesticide residue mitigation and decline processes. I am really gratified for giving me a chance to deliver vote of thanks to such an honorable audience. It was really great time with you. I have the proud privilege to say vote of thanks to all of you in the first biopesticide regulatory workshop in Bangladesh. First of all, I would like to acknowledge the contribution provided by the elite USH, USDA, and APADI. My gratitude goes to Mr. Asadullah, Honorable Director General, Department of Agriculture and Extension, Dr. Abu Said Mia, Honorable Director, uh, Plant Protection Wing, Dr. Rodi Khetarpal, Executive Secretary, Aparisar, Jessica Fernandez of USDA, Bargua Gloria, FS of USDA, Megan Francis, Agricultural Attorney of US Embassy in Dhaka, Dr. Jason Dal, Project Lead, AGLI, Grace Danon, Quality Assurance and Field Residue Research Lead, Wang Jiang, Laboratory Research Lead, Kevin Rice, Biopesticide Efficacy Research Lead, Luis Aguama, uh, Dr. Bara Prashad, Senior Consultant, Yapari, and uh, 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 Ahasan, Ahasanullah, uh, Coordinator, Yapari, Bangladesh, and all the participants who have uh, attended the inclusive Zoom meeting. My heartfelt thanks to the USAID, USDA, FAS, and Yapari team for their endless support to Bangladesh to improve phytosanitary trade compliance and pesticide residue mitigation through increased awareness of the importance of harmonization of pesticide MRLs with Codex and United States for trade and promote an integrated pest management approach. 
today in the first biopesticide regulatory workshop we have learned a lot from the presentation of Luis Sugama and Jason um, Sandel about the biopesticide. Uh, we must agree that most of the top topics are presented in the presentation uh, are not uh, known to familiar to us. Uh, so for, from Bangladeshi team and Bangladesh side, we want to give you our heartfelt thanks and gratitude. We hope we will have continuous support from the specialist team to away forward the biopesticide regulatory processes in Bangladesh. We assure you uh, that uh, we can work uh, closely with the expert team lead by Dr. Jason Dahl, as he allied, uh, and Grace Lennon, Quality Assurance and Field Research Lead, Wang Jiang, and all the team members as you that we have the constitute Bangladesh team for pesticide residue field and laboratory research, quality assurance and biopesticide and uh, efficacy research and biopesticide regulation in response to US specialist teams to carry on the above activities. And we are eagerly waiting to start our activities and our all our team members are very much energetic and uh, they are uh, eagerly waiting to do our upcoming activities. We hope with the assistance of USG specialist, specialist team, we will be able to develop our expertise for, for analyzing pesticide residue in field and laboratory and biopesticide efficacy research. And above all, we will learn the process of biopesticide registration and we can update our regulation, regulatory procedures. Again, I am assuring to all of you in the uh, presence of uh, my honorable director, Dr. Abu Said Mia, director of plant protection wing, that our uh, collaborators and our officials will work sincerely and closely with you for a fruitful implementation of all those activities. Again, I am expressing my sincere gratitude and heartfelt thanks to from DAE and from our collaborators to USC and APARI team and for creating such a wonderful opportunity uh, to enable us competent in the field. Uh, thank you all and uh, hope all our activities will be much more uh, participatory and more fruitful. Uh, uh, thanks to all, thank you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Subrata Komadas. With that, we come to end the end of today's uh, workshop. So on a kind note, I would like to remind again on filling the uh, survey, which is in the chat box. So, so you'll also receive a link for the post training by tomorrow through your email. Thank you all for your time. I'll see you all in upcoming. Uh, Dr. Ravi, please go. Thank you. Dr. Ravi, you're on mute. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I would like to say today is a very auspicious day for Apari because Ms. Sasi Rekha has become Dr. Sasi Rekha today. She defended her PhD and we wanted her to chill out, but she preferred to come as a moderator. This is her love and affection with the program, with the team, with all of you. Congratulations, Sasi, to you also. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ravi. That is uh, really great of you to announce it here. Yeah, thank you all and have a very good night and uh, have a good day. Uh, Dr. Kevin, Ire, and Grace, we also have with us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you to the USDA team and all participants from Bangladesh. Thank you.